You know, I used to feel bad if I didn't make at least 100 jumps a year in those those days, and so you, most of those years it was above that, you know. And then I, I really cut back because I'm only doing, you know, 70 or 80 or 60 or something for a couple of years. And then I started hearing rumors in, about the first 100 way, putting the first 100 way together. You know, at some of these meets, the Sphincter Brothers would sit around in Sphincter City and talk about, we had this recurring campfire story that we'd add to each campfire of, called the Million Man. And it was about this giant uh, star that was zipping through the universe in space, uh, hooked up, and uh, generations would be born and die, and if you were dying, you'd close grips and just kind of go off into space, and women would have babies that were in these pouches, and they'd grow up and then climb into their slot and be a part of the million man as it went through outer space, and it was uh, <laughs> kind of a nutty story, but at that time the record was low enough that a hundred man, hundred way seemed like a million, and then they're talking about actually doing it, a first hundred man, hundred way formation, and I thought, you know what, I'd like to be on the first the first hundred way because it's like a million men as far as I'm concerned and I can tell my buddies that have since retired or or you know half of us were still jumping then about that so Roger Freak brother Roger Nelson was uh, putting one together and there were two groups there was a uh, Tommy Pyrus group in Florida and there was Roger Nelson's group uh, up in the Midwest uh, working out a sandwich his drop zone in sandwich and uh, so I talked to Roger over the winter, who, whom I had known since the early 70s. He and Carl uh, started Freak, the fabulous uh, Flying Freak Brothers organization. Uh, I made a jump with Roger in, uh, I forget what year, it was at Hastings, Michigan. And when we landed, he goes, hey, you three guys just got your Freak Brother number. And we're going, great, what's that? Uh, and he goes, well, it's this blah, 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 blah. Because he and his brother Carl, uh, when they started jumping up, I think at Hinkley, Illinois, uh, I remember one time, or the story was, uh, Lou Jecker was uh, jumping there, and these guys showed up uh, as students after have made a few jumps, and somebody goes, oh, look who's here, the Freak Brothers, referring to Carl and Roger. And that's how that thing got its name and got started. So I was uh, lucky to get, uh, I became Freak, Freak Brother number 42, uh, as a result of that dive. So I had known uh, both Carl and Roger for a few years, several years. By this time, as I was talking to Roger, uh, this would have been the winter of uh, 84 to 85, and I said, hey, I hear you're putting together a hundred way, is that right? And he goes, yeah, yeah, we're having tryouts uh, starting in the spring, next spring. And he says, you ought to come up and try out for it. And I said, well, that's what I was thinking about. I just thought I'd see if it was really happening. And, and he says, yeah, sure, come up. And, like I said, by a couple of years before that, I was only making 60 or 70 or whatever, so I thought, okay, so I went to the land the next spring to kind of tune up, do their Easter boogie, and uh, get back into long dives and formations and stuff again, kind of get back up to speed, and then I started going to a sandwich uh, for the tryouts and uh, to get on that load, and that was a fun summer, you know, I was, I was back in it again, you know, jumping every weekend, pounding the jumps out and having a great time. A lot of those people I knew from Midwest Boogies when I was making new friends and we were doing quality skydives, they're all videotaped, good debriefs, I'm learning a lot, you know, and a refreshing thing was, uh, you know, people talk about the Sky God attitude and here's these good jumpers sitting around and we're sitting around together in the evenings going, okay, what's working for you, what do you do here and doing this and it was like learning RW again, we're all offering each other tips and uh, support uh, nobody's walking around all haughty and I know all this and, and all that. It was uh, exciting and uh, we're, we're doing something big and it was just great. Just great. And uh, homeless people that summer tried out the, the hot slot, at least what we were thinking was the 20-way the base because it was like a speed 20-way team and uh, everybody wanted to, or was trying out for that, the people that came through. And much to my, I've later found out there were over 200 some odd people that from around the country that came and try out for these 20 slots and uh, not only did I get on the uh, 20 way base uh, but I was going 20th I got to go last on this speed 20 way formation uh, the 100 way formation was a series of color coded wedges coming out from the base and uh, one of the guys uh, Daryl or uh, George Galloway uh, who was Precision uh, Parachute Company Tennessee was in the uh, was a five-way base, uh, and 
His nickname was uh, Boomer. Now, this is how my memory's going. I, I hope I'm getting this accurate. And so they called that five-way, then became known as the Sonic Boom. And then we decided the 20 of us, the 20-way bass, would become Kaboom. So we had Boomer, the Sonic Boom, and Kaboom. The 20-way team was Kaboom. And that was the bass for the 100-way formation. Now, I was a tail of the dark, dark blue diamond. Uh, it was a pentadiamond bass for the 20-way the bass for five, five diamonds. And uh, so we practiced all summer, and uh, we're going to do it at the convention that August. Uh, again, people came from all over the country. California guys were there, the Florida guys, you know, all the hot skydivers, the names you see in the magazines, they're all showing up, and, and we're going to do the uh, first world's first underway. Well, meanwhile, Pyrus's group is trying, too. They're trying to, yeah, here's the, I had to put that on. I lost mine years ago. <laughs> Freak Brothers. Uh, so we get to uh, Freeport, or Freakport as we called it, uh, for the convention to do the first hundred way. And uh, we uh, start banging out the loads. We made 399 ways, never made the hundred way. I never thought that we would start and begin that without success, but we didn't make a hundred way in 85. We made 399 ways, and one of them, which I have a, an enlargement of, on the wall even though it wasn't complete because it was one of those dream skydives just like you think about it in the airplane on the way up where everybody's there the place does the formation didn't take a hit a hard hit it's flying straight and level the whole darn time it was a just a perfect skydive except one person was out but it was an excellent jump even though we didn't get a hundred but uh, so some of these were good dives, but uh, we didn't get our goal the 100 way. Well, the other group didn't either that year. So we're coming back in 86 to go for the world's first 100 way. And we're practicing a sandwich again. And then we get a call after the Nationals that Pyrus, is, the other group, built one. Uh, at the Nationals, I think. Uh, in, in Oklahoma, was that? Yeah. And it's like, oh, man, they, they you were on it. <laughs> good for you. Oh. Okay, so, uh, okay, well, God, they, they got it, you know, well, good for them. Now what? And Roger goes, well, we'll build 120. All right, so I, that, go for that. So we start practicing the 100 for 120. Same deal every weekend, great skydives, a lot of fun. And um, that fall, we're trying for the 120 way. The base was uh, fast falling. I was docking uh, on Jim Bohr, uh, formerly of the James Gang, many years before, uh, who, by the way, if memory serves me, was the first team, first group to build a 10-man star, back loop, 10-man star. So I remember seeing pictures in the magazine, blew me away. You know. Well, anyway, I was docking on Bohr. And in my own arrogance, see, by this time, this is 86, so I've been jumping some years now and uh, thought I was decent, and was, uh, but uh, I didn't want to wear weights. Uh, and in my own arrogance, uh, I thought I, I can fall fast enough by my own talent and all that. Now, I, some of the docks went okay, and others, uh, I was uh, had a little bit of fall rate problem. And it wasn't like I was taking it out, but I wasn't really flying my slot as well as I should have. And I finally decided, okay, I need to put weights on. And one of my friends, Nancy McCoy, was uh, bringing me her weight belt when Roger uh, Ponce and Roger Nelson called me up and said, hey, look, uh, we've been having some reports that we're having some trouble in your sector because you're not falling fast enough, and uh, so I think we're going to ax you and put somebody else in there. And I said, look, I said, well, I've got a weight vest on, on its way right now. It ought to get here any second. And... Um, Roger Ponce go, looks at the other Roger and says, well, what do you think? One more time. And, and Roger, my buddy, Roger Freakbrother, says, I think it's time to sharpen the axe. Boom, I'm out. And if I, you thought I felt bad getting axed from the 40-way world record back in 75, now here I am, uh, you know, Mr. 100-way, 20 last on the Kaboom team, getting axed from, now we had built 120, the first 120, but we held it, I think, 2.7 seconds, just short of the three-second limit or for records in it, three seconds. I ought to know that. So 
So I was in the first completed one, but then I got X before it went over three, and uh, some of my friends started bitching about it and complaining, and they're going. And he said, "Look, if you don't want to get axed, you just shut up, and uh, we'll do what we want." And so that became the lowest point in my career, and probably remains so to this day. I don't see how there could be a worse one. Um, but uh, so I watched the record, which was held barely over three seconds. Uh, those dives never went well that year, very well at all. There were funnels that break off and all that, just like you want to be in a. Talk about the funnel of death. Here's a funnel right at breakoff altitude with over 100 people tumbling around. That was exciting. <laughs> so, well, anyway, that was that year. Uh, that was 86. And then 87 went by, and then 88 comes around, and it's time for a new world record. Uh, and uh, because the Europeans used to do this thing, you know, we'd set some, that we Americans would set some mark, and they'd up it by one or two. And then we'd beat that record in a year or two by 20. And then they'd snivel out a 122 way or something, you know, that kind of thing. They'd add one or two people on and, and we'd, we'd up the ante by 10 or 12 or 20 or something like that. So they must have done something since the 120 way and, and uh, they decided, okay, we're going to go big. And uh, they came up, they meaning Roger Nelson, Guy Manos, Jerry Bird, uh, Roger Ponce de Leon, uh, were the organizers that year. And so uh, here we all go back to Sandwich again, try out for the uh, new record team for that year, and they decided we're going to build a diamond, a big diamond. Uh, with enough of this loops and rooms thing. We're going to build a real formation with link grips. We're going to build a diamond, a big diamond, and the biggest one ever. And so that's what we were working on that year. And they had two, two or three different groups uh, that were jumping at the at the uh, practices. Uh, Roger would take one and Manos would take a group and Jerry Bird had a group and Bird had kind of like the uh, bench team. Well it wasn't the bench team but it was the you know it wasn't the, the A team or the uh, it's hard to say because they, they weren't the teams because they were all sections because we couldn't put that many people on the planes. You know?